As you all know, we are still within the time of the 40 hours devotion, and the concluding day for such falls on this feast of the dedication of St. Michael the Archangel. Now these 40 hours that will have transpired by the time we conclude today have been, perhaps for some of you, hundreds of occasions of coming and keeping watch with our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. For 40 hours, he makes himself available to us in a way that he normally does not do. We can imagine that all of the candles that are lit on the altar and in the sanctuary are something in the way of his open for business sign. Now, the, our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament is the same Lord that was born at Bethlehem. And that is evidenced, that is, is, as it were, confirmed by the fact that the preface of the Mass today is that of the Nativity. And that is also the same preface used for any Mass of the Blessed Sacrament. It's the same Jesus who cured the deaf and the lame, restored sight to the blind, and cured bodily Ill illnesses that were beyond the reach of medicine. We can think of the woman who had the issue of blood from Holy Scripture. And he also exercised those who were possessed by the devil. And it's the same Jesus who exercises his power through his priests in order to stay with us in the tabernacle. When our Lord works the great miracle of transubstantiation, the changing of the substance of the bread and wine to that of his body and blood on the altar, he pours himself into those elements so that all that remains are the appearances of those things. It's the same God who created the universe out of nothing. That same God puts himself under the appearances of bread and wine in order to stay with us and to give himself to us as a nourishment and a medicine for the long journey that is this life towards heaven. We can also see the delicacy of our Lord in instituting this sacrament. How repulsed we would be and how revolting to think that our Lord would give us a piece of physical flesh to eat at the altar. While it is truly his flesh, to all appearances, it is something along the way of a food. Now this life can certainly take its toll on the soul. Disappointments, betrayals by others, loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, a friend that we had, the one friend perhaps that we had, being diagnosed with a sickness, cancer perhaps, or simply having no one that knows about it or cares. In our isolation, we can feel our weaknesses and our failings all the more keenly. They become all the more painful to endure. And yet the good God lets us feel those cuts, those betrayals, those isolations, so as to keep us alert to the fact that this earth is not our true home, that this life is not what we're made for. If our Lord never allowed some hardship, some difficulty, some disappointment to come into our lives, then we would never want to go to heaven. We'd want to stay here. And when we are kept alert as to what is our true home, our true destination, we feel ourselves urged to move forward because we want to get to that goal. We want to reach that destination. 
You can imagine when taking a long trip, at first it seems that the road is endless, that time has stopped, but then you see that wonderful sign, how many miles until your exit. Then suddenly you don't need that last cup of coffee, and it doesn't seem to be all that bad of a trip anymore. And so we have a better appreciation then for the Blessed Sacrament. This bread from heaven, this heavenly sustenance. We can recall the incident from the Old Testament of Elias, who was fleeing from the vengeful spirit of Jezebel, who was seeking to end his life. And he prayed for death. He abandoned himself to the goodness of God, saying, please, in my life. And an angel came and brought a jug of water and a hearth cake and says, get up and eat. And he did. And he went back to sleep. And the angel came and said again, get up and eat. Get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. And he ate, following the command of the, of the angel. And he had then the strength to walk 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, to hear what God wanted him to do. Our 40 days and 40 nights is this life. And the Holy Eucharist is the food that is to give us the strength to walk the long journey to the eternal mountain of God to heaven. That's what we're supposed to go for. That's what we're supposed to be aiming for. Too often, we think that, well, if I can just sneak in the back door of purgatory, that's good enough. Okay, yes, you'll be saved, but that's not the goal. The goal is to get to heaven. You can imagine something in the way of an aircraft trying to land the craft inside of a hangar of a mountain. If you aim for the hangar directly, you're going to miss it and you're going to crash. You have to aim higher. And then you just might get there. But the Holy Eucharist is also a medicine for our souls. Sometimes we get sick. We have infections. Ear infections, throat infections, stomach infections, you name it. And sometimes eating more food isn't a solution. It isn't a cure. I will eat more salad. I will drink more tea. Well and good. But that is not a fix to an infection. But rather taking an antibiotic that kills that infection, that fights that infection. Now, we all have spiritual infections due to our sins. Certainly, we have the wounds of original sin. No one is free from that. And those wounds incline us to sin. But then we have our personal wounds, wounds that are due to our personal actual sins, the residue, as it were. We have our weaknesses, our bad tendencies, our deliberate faults. And we need a medicine to counteract that sickness, a medicine that is proportioned to the problem. And that's the Holy Eucharist. We recall Pope St. Pius X in his decree concerning Frequent communion. Three things are necessary. Number one, to be in the state of grace. That is, that you are conscious at the time of receiving communion of no mortal sin. Two, that you have a supernatural intention. And that's a broad range there. But it cannot be simply a natural intention. That is, I'm going to communion because I want to appear to my spouse or to my family or my friends that I am pious and that I am devout. 
And the third, to be observing the Eucharistic fast. Pretty simple conditions when you think about it. And yet, sometimes we can fall into the trap and thinking that the Holy Eucharist is a reward for our being good. Something like we give a piece of candy for a child who does his job well. That's the idea of the Jansenists, the heretics, who think that Holy Communion is a reward only for those who have been the best. And that's not the idea of our Lord. Now on this feast of St. Michael, in reflecting on these considerations of the Blessed Sacrament, we recall that St. Michael is the head, the commander of the celestial army of the angels, the one who threw the devil out of heaven after the battle in heaven. And we should cultivate as devotion to St. Michael as it relates to Holy Communion. We should ask him to guard and protect our soul from any influence of the devil. To guard our soul so that the same God whose rights he defended in heaven may come and dwell in the children of men, which is his delight, as Holy Scripture says. We should ask St. Michael to accompany us when we go to Mass, to take our offering and to place it on the altar next to the offering of our Lord, in union with that offering, as the third prayer found in the Missal after the consecration says. And we should ask St. Michael to throw out of our soul whatever will not serve God, whatever cries to heaven saying, non serviam, I will not serve. We should ask him to throw that out so that God can come and be our nourishment and our medicine, and thus truly our Emmanuel, God with us. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.